All right, we are officially going. So good evening, and thank you all for joining me tonight. My name is Jill Cleese. I am the iSchools Career Center Liaison. Um, I wanted to welcome all of you for being here. How many of you, and I'm assuming most people, but let's do a show of hands, how many of you are all uh, first semester, just starting out? Let's get a sense of who we have on here. So awesome. Oh, so maybe about half. So not everybody. All right. Super cool. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through all of the resources, career resources that are available to you. And I think it's super important for you all to know about this because as uh, online students working in a virtual environment, I want to make sure that you realize that you are fully supported with Career Center resources. You have a lot of good information right at your fingertips. And then I am also always available to assist you. The best way to get in touch with me is through email. My email address is here on the screen. Um, if we need to ever set up appointments on the phone, we can certainly do that. But most people work with me through email. So why this particular workshop? I really want to introduce you all to career services. And I want to also connect with current students so that you, again, know that you are supported and who is here to support you. So I think that's one of the most important things that we have going on for all of you is that even though you aren't physically in a brick and mortar building, you've got some good resources. So let's get rolling. How many of you have actually seen this career development page? Again, let's do a show of hands. All right, so good, a good number of you. Awesome. So for those of you who haven't, I highly recommend that you check it out. So right on the main um, navigation bar at the top, career development is one of those navigation spots that we have front and center, which is awesome. Within the green box are all of the main categories you listed under here. And then underneath all of those are a lot of subcategories. So there's a ton of information on here. So it's important for you to just know what's here, kind of familiarize yourself with the information. So when you're at a point where you want to go and check this information out, you know exactly where to find it. I also encourage all of you to ask me questions tonight. So I like my workshops to be really informal and interactive. So feel free to just type your questions into the chat box and I will be checking them as we go throughout the evening. I'm going to put that link in there again in case anybody just came on and missed it. Um, I'm trying to get everybody who signed on tonight to log in using the link below that I just put in the chat box. Again, we're trying something new this semester. We're trying to get um, uh, a good, accurate count and student ID numbers of all people who are on our workshops. Okay. So thinking about career webcasts or career workshops. Um, the career webcasts you can find, again, let me go back here, from the career development site where this blue arrow is. This is where you can find recordings to sessions. So it's a good place to check for any past recordings of workshops. And career webcasts are those where we have actual professionals in the field of LIS talking about their backgrounds, how they got their jobs, what advice they would give to you, and recommendations that they would give to you. So we have a wide variety of people. So again, if you're new to um, iSchool, you're new to LIS field, you might want to spend some time browsing around this information and seeing what's there and getting some really good information. One of the other things that you can do with our speakers is you're always welcome to reach out and contact them and ask them questions. So they always agree to that when they come on to do our career webcasts. So you can think about those as people who are part now of your network that you can reach out to. Oops, what happened to this page? Let's see if it's going to pop up. Mm -hmm, hold on. Let's see, sometimes these take a little bit of time, but this is weird. I haven't had this happen. OK, we got you. Why that one is not popping up, I don't know. So a couple of the pages that are not there, which I will just tell you what they are, um, one session or one thing that you have are career e-newsletters. How many people saw the newsletter that came out last month in August? There was a career e-newsletter. So you will get those every single month. I will send them out. They'll always have a job search tip. They'll always link to different career resources. And then they'll have something called hot jobs. And I'll talk a little bit more about those and where you can find those as I move along in the workshop. We also have a career blog. 
So this is something that is worthwhile checking out or if there's a particular topic that you want to see if we have information on, check the career blog and see what's out there. There's a lot of good information. So this is just one additional resource for you. We actually have a student assistant who has been probably for the last year posting some amazing career posts on this blog. So do check that out as well. So Handshake, this is our job database, our campus job database. So this actually goes through the main career center on the campus. Every single student, you're already registered within Handshake. So as soon as a new student comes on and you have your student ID, you're actually now set up in Handshake. To log into it, all you need is your SJSU1 ID and the password that you use to log into your email. That's how you'd log into Handshake. So when you get in here, and what I'd recommend at some point to go check it out, all you want to do is fill out your career interest areas, and you can set up your profile, and then you're ready to go, and you can start searching on jobs. So based on your career interests, the profile, and your major, it automatically starts to find jobs that would be interesting to you based on what you put in your profile. So I would use Handshake as one of the many job options or job uh, search sites that you have available to you. You want to think about it this way, is that employers who are specifically seeking you, the SJSU iSchool student, will post positions on Handshake because they're trying to recruit you. So it's a really good resource to use. You're going to find a variety of different positions. There's going to be full-time positions. There are plenty of part-time positions. There's volunteer positions. Sometimes there's project-based jobs. For example, I have seen individual people who have collections within their own home that they're looking for an iSchool student to hire to actually digitize a certain collection for themselves, for example. So you never know what you're going to find here in Handshake, so I would totally recommend that this be something that you check out. You could set up a search, so if jobs pop up, it'll get sent to your email, or just go in once a month and review it. So again, it's just one of your options, but it's something that it's, it's right here, it's on our school, it's free. And if you are outside of California, there's also positions that are from all across the United States. So when I send out the monthly newsletter, for example, and I put the hot jobs on there, I try to find a variety of jobs and from a variety of different locations so that you can start to see the breadth of the kind of opportunities that you have available to you. And that's something to even think about, particularly being new to the field, but to start kind of doing an environmental scan. And what I mean by that is you just start identifying what it actually is possible, right? Who is hiring? What are those job titles? And what locations are they in? Because it doesn't mean that you need to stay exactly where you're at when you start to do your job search. Maybe you are going to cast a wide net, and maybe you're open to relocating or um, changing, job geograph changing jobs geographically. So just one resource. Questions about that? Using Handshake, how to find it, anything like that? So again, feel free to ask me questions, and it really can kind of be anything that's related to jobs. Jennifer's asking, are there virtual jobs? And there are sometimes virtual jobs in here. I don't see those as many. Those are a little more um, niche when we have to go searching for them, but I have seen some virtual jobs in there for sure. And we definitely have virtual internships, and I will talk about those shortly. All right, let's see if the other slides are popping up here. Okay, very good. So now let's just dive in a little bit into the career development site, and we're going to do it by looking at basic career development model. So what that means is there are really three main steps that any one person goes through when they're searching for internships, part-time work, or full-time work. It doesn't really matter which, but it's all basically the same process. So what that means is we can go through this process and these steps many different times, but often people, when they're thinking about a job search, they go right to step number three, right, which is find a job. So instantly what they're going to do is they will put together a resume and they send it out, and then they may not get the job leads that they're looking for, and then they get kind of stressed and confused and they back up a little bit. Because um, sometimes we need to back up to step number one, which is doing a little bit of self-assessment, really figuring out what our interests are, what our skills are, what we're really interested in doing. So something brought you all here to um, library school, 
but you may not know really what you want to do within library school. So if you need to back up and you need to do a little more self-assessment, we have some information here. And again, it's under the career development site when you think about the navigation. Um, it's under career direction. And so I just want to point out that there are some different um, self-assessment, not a whole lot of exercises, but some questions and some information for you to take a look at to help you kind of think and reflect about what it is that you're most interested in doing. And one of those areas is thinking about this Venn diagram right here. So when you think about any type of job that you're thinking about, you want to consider what are the people that I want to work with? What's the setting that I'd like to see myself in and what are those job functions? So for example, if we broke this down, functions might be with those things that you most like to do in a job. And maybe it's things like solving problems or writing or working with numbers or working with machines or data or analyzing documents. Maybe it's providing customer service and helping people. We might think about what activities you truly enjoy or what classes and subjects that have been your favorites and why. So it's asking yourself a lot of questions for you to kind of reflect upon, write them down, um, and really think about what are those um, job functions that might be interesting to you. And then when you think about the people, you know, who do you think you want to be supporting as you go forward? How do you want to interact with people? What kinds of people? Is it youth, children, students? Is it working adults? Is it seniors? Do you like to work uh, with, us, with colleagues and clients? Or do you prefer to work mostly with other people? Or do you prefer working mostly by yourself? So again, questions for you just to ponder and think about. And if you're really kind of struggling to figure out where you fit, and it may not be right now if you're new to iSchool, but it might happen as you go along, you could go through some of the self-assessment write down some of your answers, and then we could set up a phone call appointment and we could talk about it. And hopefully I could add a little bit of clarity to what you're thinking. The settings, for example, it's really where do you see yourself working? Do you want to be in a quiet environment or maybe it's pretty busy and it's hectic? Is the work always changing or do you like work that's more predictable? Do you prefer to work more with machines and technology or answering questions and assisting people? Or do you want a work setting that's in an academic setting, corporate setting? highly structured, maybe it's more informal. So there's so many things to consider. And so backing up and starting with a little self-assessment can actually help get you started a little bit with a little more focus. And what we call right here in this middle area where these three areas come together, I like to call that the sweet spot. So if you can actually end up identifying where the people setting and function start to overlap for you, that's what we would call your sweet spot. And that's what you could use to use as your focus as you move forward when you think about the specific areas that you want to focus on with your career um, and what kind of job search that you might want to go into later on. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that so far? All right. You guys are kind of quiet. That's OK. So step number two is researching. This one I think is super important. We've got some really, really good resources for you. So again, under the Career Development tab, and it's under Career Direction, there's something called Career Direction Research. And that's going to bring you to this page. And so I've got these purple arrows here. This one that says MLIS Skills at Work. This is a snapshot of job postings. And what this is, it talks about and shows you the emerging trends, like the most current trends that are happening in the LIS field right now. So you're, get, again, going to see what types of jobs and job titles are most common when somebody does a search, what kinds of employers are hiring people with an MLS, MLIS, and it's very, it's very varied. There's a variety of jobs that wouldn't just be a public library or an academic library, but it's very, 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 it's very varied. Look at me. <laughs> I'm on a roll with very, very. Um, and it gives you an idea of what are the skills that you will want to develop if you want to maneuver your career over in a particular direction. So you can start looking at some job postings. And you might think, well, it's kind of early. Why would I look at job postings now? Again, what that does is that helps you see an environmental scan of what is available and what's possible. And so that helps you to get some ideas of what is out there. So that's how you start to play around with some of this information. Digging a little bit deeper into that, we have a section called Career Pathways. How many of you have seen that? I feel like that's pretty common when you're starting to look at the program. 
Awesome. Awesome. That's a lot of people. That's good. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, do check it out. It doesn't mean that you need to stick to a specific career pathway, but it gives you an idea, again, of what is possible, and then it gives you a sense of some of the classes that you might want to take as you're planning ahead and looking forward. But the way our, the way our major is set up, it doesn't mean that you say you picked digital curation as the career pathway that you were most interested in. It doesn't mean when you graduate that you're going to have an MLIS with an emphasis in digital curation. But it means that you are going to take a number of classes that relate to that and then you will um, be able to, to work on projects and develop skills in those areas. But the good news is that you could still take classes that are in these other areas as well. So I think what's exciting about that and what I will often t tell students is that follow what your interests are. You don't need to be narrow in your scope and only stay the classes that are in that specific area. But if you have interest in a variety of other areas, take those classes. They will all be useful to you in the way you might discover an interest area that you didn't even know was possible. Hey, look at that. We just matched Amy and Cassia. Maybe you two can like, connect offline and share information about following the digital curation pathway, for example. All right, let me switch over here. Career environments. This is pretty cool. This is a newer section to the career development site. And you, again, you find it in that same area under career direction, and there's career pathways, and then there's career environments. So we took three of the main areas where students typically find jobs in the LIS field. And we developed a whole lot of information that gives you a sense of what it's truly like to work in that particular area. So I highly recommend that you check that out as well. So again, everything I'm showing you is just informational so that you know where to find it and you can go back and do a little bit more research to see what's there. But you can check out what's, what, what it's like to work in an academic library. And we even break it down into the different type of academic libraries, different sizes, salary ranges, what you would need to be to be successful in those jobs. Again, what are the skills that would be most important? What kind of classes would you want to take? So you can look at that from academic, public, and then the special libraries. So it's pretty cool stuff. So community profiles. This is something that is super important, especially when you're trying to identify, and this happens a lot when people are further along in their program and they're feeling maybe a little lost and they're not, again, quite sure what it is they want to do or what their focus is, or they've come up with a specific idea, but they don't really know how to maneuver themselves in that direction. So what I'll recommend often is that people check out the community profile section. So at the top navigation bar, you're going to find that under the people tab. And then we have it broken down into these section or interest areas. So you could pick, here's virtual internships right there for the person who asked you about virtual jobs. You might want to check out the virtual internships and get a sense of what are some of the experiences that our students have had working in a virtual internship, where they have done it, and what kind of information that they're sharing with you that could be super helpful when you get along to that point as well. So community profiles, I love and I recommend this section a lot to different students. I also do this one here, our alumni career spotlights. So this is finding out about, hey, where are our alumni working these days and what are they doing and how do they get there? And I think alumni career spotlights is interesting not only to be able to research it and see what people are doing, but secondly, if somebody's doing something that you have an interest in doing or you think you might want to do that or you're interested in the company where they're working, again, these are people that you can reach out to to do an informational interview. And when I say informational interviewing, how many of you know exactly what that means? So just a couple people then. So I'll spend just a moment to explain informational interviewing. I actually have workshops that are completely on informational interviewing. So informational interviewing is when 
you, I, I think of it as like using being a student to your advantage, actually, and you kind of play the student card. And you can say we're going to reach out to Martin here, Martin Kelly, who's up on the screen. So you might send an email to Martin, and you go, hey, Martin, I'm a new student at San Jose State in the iSchool, and I was looking on their Alumni Career Spotlights page, and um, I saw your information on there that you're doing digital collections, and that's one of the areas that I'm really interested in, and I was wondering if if I could set up like 20 to 30 minutes um, of your time on a phone appointment and ask you some questions about how you got your job at Colby College Libraries. So what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I want a short bit of your time. Here is the common area that we have, and I would just like to talk with you. And most people are going to respond and want to help you out instead of time to talk with you. Why? Because they remember what it's like to be in your shoes. Martin was in your shoes. He graduated in 2004. He still remembers, and he's going to be willing to help out and talk to somebody. So in that case then, if you guys set your time up, you're going to go ahead and you're going to figure out and write down, so you're very organized and prepared, what are all the questions that I want to ask Martin? And maybe I want to ask Martin, you know, how did you get your job? How did you decide that you wanted to be in digital collections? What are the steps that you took to get there? What advice would you give to me if I wanted to go in that direction? What classes do you recommend that I take uh, at San Jose State while I'm getting my degree? Um, what type of internship or um, extra experience would help make me most marketable in that type of job? What do I like or what do you like best about working in your job? What do you find, what are the challenges that you find of working in that job? So you see you can ask them a lot of questions that's going to help you decide like, yeah, this is something I really want to do. Or you might go, hmm, I don't know if that's the thing that I really want to do. And then you're going to, then you're going to explore it a little bit further. So hopefully that gives you a good idea of how you could use the alumni career spotlights and those community profiles. Questions from anybody so far about anything I have said? Because what I kind of was talking about right there with informational interviewing is networking. So if you wanted more about what I just described in terms of informational interviewing, under the networking section, there is something here right here. We have what is networking, the one minute commercial, informational interviewing, and interview questions to ask. So that is a super important section right there when you're thinking about reaching out and getting some information from other people. And I'll, you'll often hear me talk about networking a lot. I'll do dedicated workshops specifically on networking and informational interviewing because it is the number one job search strategy. So that means that most people find their jobs through a networking connection. And when I say most people, it's like about 80% of people get their jobs through networking. So it's a super important skill to develop, and it's much easier to do it when you're a student, because again, you can play that, hey, I'm a student and I was really looking forward to talking with you and getting information. Uh, is it Rocio? We network through our group projects. Absolutely, you totally do. So that's how you are meeting people. And think about it, everybody who's come in to the program, most of these people, for one, are career changers, which means they have a network of people already. And you might go, yeah, well, big deal. If they're career changers, that doesn't mean their network is in the LIS field. It doesn't necessarily matter. People know people. So just having a, a wide net of people that you're connected to is always super helpful. So yes, keep networking with the people who are in your group projects. You could go and connect with those students, those people on LinkedIn. Now you have all of their connection information. Justin says, in just two semesters, I have up to three pages in references thanks to group projects. That is phenomenal. That is really fantastic. Way to go. And hopefully you are connecting with people then going back on LinkedIn. That's something that I use a lot. So, for example, all of you on this workshop tonight, if I, have, if I was you and I had attended a workshop and I thought, hey, this person's got some good information, I think I'd like to connect with them, I would go back to me, for example, and I'd be like, Hey, Jill, thanks for, thanks for being on the workshop tonight with San Jose State, you know, iSchool, I learned a lot, I'd love to add you to my professional network and connect with you on LinkedIn, boom. So that's how I, I would start connecting with people who could be doing um, online workshops and you don't meet them in person, but you have that connection with them. So Maggie's saying references from students. Yep, that's what it sounded like, Maggie. So as you are all working together and you all come with backgrounds of people you know, it's a great way to connect. 
Something else that's really important for all of you is, uh, starting out is uh, joining professional associations. So as um, students, you get a complimentary free one-year membership in one of these following professional associations, the ALA, the SLA, um, uh, ASSIST, and Society of American Archivists. So you get to pick which one you want. You should be getting um, an email pretty soon if you haven't already about information on how to do that. But I highly recommend that you take advantage of it. One, it's free, so why pass that up? But doing or being involved in a membership or an association is another great way to network and meet people who are in the field that you're interested in and start making some more connections. You can get involved. You can volunteer at conferences. There's a lot of different things that you could do to help expand your network. So think about it. If you have the time, one, I would join, and secondly, if you have the time, try to get involved as much as you can so that you can connect with others. Okay, so we kind of went through and thought about steps. Steps one, step two, and then step three was now finally getting to that section of finding a job. Rebecca says, can you still access this, these resources after you graduate? You absolutely can. It's a really good question. So all the career development web uh, resources are available. There's no firewall, right? There's no password that you need to get them. They're just on the Internet. So you can absolutely access them. If students, once you graduate, if you wanted to continue to work with me in a capacity, um, the first, let's see, you will still have access to Handshake, the job search database, for up to one year, and that's just free. If you wanted to work with me uh, getting career resources, you would need to join the alumni, the, no, that's, what is it? You would. You would join through the main career center and get an alumni membership. I think that's $25 for a year, which is really a, a pretty nominal fee. That way I would still work with you. I could still critique your resumes and cover letters. We could practice interviewing or, you know, do uh, phone appointments, anything like that. So if you need more information, you can always let me know. But when you get to finding a job, we have a lot of different resources here, and I just want to point them out. So there are um, job listing resources, and the little yellow arrow here is going to placement agencies. That's something that a lot of students don't think about, so I just want to plant the seed in your brain. That's a viable job search option to use an LIS placement agency to help you find a job. It's a great way to get your foot in the door, and it's a great way to reality test some of your ideas. In fact, there are jobs that are working with the government, that they, they hire our students once they've graduated, like at the Library of Congress, that they only hire them through a placement agency, and that would be through as a long-term employee, like one, two years, sometimes more, as the contracts keep getting renewed. So it's just a good option that I just want to throw out there and uh, just plant that seed with you. Okay, something more accessible to most of you would be to find an internship. Now, you won't be eligible for an internship until you've um, completed Info 294, Info 200, 202, and 203. But nothing stops you from using this site right now to do a little research, again, to see what is possible. What are some of those internship sites that we have set up? And I also think about our internships in two different ways. I think there's formal internships and what I call informal internships. So when you're using the internship database, which I'm showing you right here on the screen, I think of those as formal internships, which means those are set up specifically in our database. There is specific supervision that has to be kind of okayed um, with our school. And as I mentioned, you have to have those prerequisite classes. Uh oh, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me right now? Yes, okay, okay, good. So maybe just one person that lost audio. Um, let me back up to you. Sarah has a question. How many units do you have to complete before applying for internships? Um, I don't know if all these classes are three units, um, Sarah, but it's, it's four classes. So it's Info 294. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Info 294 is the internship class. You have to complete Info 200. Um, 202 and 203, so it's those first three classes that you need to complete before then you can do an internship, a formal internship through this database. Okay, just making sure everybody could hear. Okay, we're good. Um, 
And this is also where you can do a little bit of research on virtual internships, which I think is amazing. How many of you would be interested in doing a virtual internship or some sort of virtual opportunity? Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing to do, it's particularly if you're working full time or you have a really busy life and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I get some LIS experience also, that I would definitely think of a virtual internship. So as I said, you could go on here now and you could do a little bit of research to identify what's out there, and that way as you get closer to the point of when you'd apply for a virtual internship, you have a pretty good idea of what it is you're most focused on. There have been a number of students, too, who had virtual internships, and they were able to continue working for that company even once they graduated and keep having a, a virtual um, type of job. So I'm, I'm always surprised at how many amazing opportunities are listed in this database. But again, let me describe my, my difference between the, the formal internship, which are these in the database, and what I say informal. So if we go back to Handshake, which I talked about earlier, um, Handshake is the job database. There may be internships that get posted in there that are specific for MLIS students, and they will have the title of internship, and you can apply for those. You do not have to have the prerequisites of these three classes completed in order to apply for something that may have internship in its title off of Handshake. Handshake. Those are two different databases, two different sorts of requirements. So I hope that makes sense, and if you have any questions about those, please let me know. Okay. So LinkedIn, I do point this out a little bit because this is, I also do, we have workshops that are specifically all about LinkedIn, but this is something that I often get a lot of questions about on how to create a professional profile and how to use it in your job search. So. If you have specific questions, you can first start here with the website, again, it's under career development, using social media for your job search, and you can check out the information that we have about LinkedIn to get you set up with your profile. Um, Andrew's got a question, or let's see, he's put in some info. He just looked up info 294, it states that the prerequisites are 200, 202, 203, 204, there we go, and nine units, wow! I don't remember it being so much but maybe it changed. I really don't remember it being quite so much. Hmm. That is good to know, and thank you for looking that up so closely. I'll have to go back and check it, too. Okay, course description online. Wow. All right, so if that is the case, then, I would definitely, if you're looking to get some experience sooner than that, definitely check, check out the opportunities that are posted on Handshake. Yeah, all right, thank you guys, I appreciate that, filling me in on that piece. Um, does anybody have any general questions about LinkedIn, by the way? I often get the question of, it: is it important to, to have a profile? And I would say nowadays, it is incredibly important to have a LinkedIn profile. Most all employers these days are going to look for people that are on LinkedIn, they're going to check it out. But I would say, I'll give it the caveat, I guess, that if you are, in some ways super opposed to any sort of social media, you know, then I'm not going to say, yeah, you have to do it. But what I do want to say is that for people in an information science major, being savvy about social media and knowing how to maneuver through social media and thinking about it as an emerging technology is something that you really want to consider and think about, because I think that's all about where your field is going. I wouldn't necessarily have multiple LinkedIn profiles. I think that would be um, a little bit of a problem. Are you asking that as a career changer because you're trying to keep one private from your employer, perhaps? Otherwise, having multiple LinkedIn profiles could be quite confusing, yeah. So I get that question a lot, too, Lynn about people being concerned about having LinkedIn. Um, oh, here, what did Amy say? Do I have to accept requests from coworkers I don't trust? Okay, I'm going to come back to that question, Amy, because that's a really good one. Um, it would still be an issue to have multiple, though, because if people are going to search for your name, you're going to come up in two different ways, and it's going to be a little awkward. The piece that you could, um, uh, Lynn, 
if you are updating your LinkedIn profile and you feel like that's going to be an issue with your employer, I guess what I'm going to ask is, does your employer know that you are going back to school? So updating your LinkedIn profile and using that sort of as your reason can be a really valid reason to update your LinkedIn profile. You now have a different education to put on there. You have different projects to put on there. You could even say it was a course requirement, right? It was one about one of your courses to go in and update your LinkedIn profile. So I would be more inclined to work on it from that perspective. But you could also set your privacy settings, and you can also set a setting that when you make any changes to your profile, you it, the messaging is not going out to the people that you're connected with. So look about look in your settings and see what you can set so that you feel more, more comfortable doing it. Uh, Rocio, I just don't feel like I have enough experience in LIS. So it doesn't always mean, and this brings up a really good question, thank you for saying that. You may not have enough experience in LIS at this point, but it's a good idea to start to think about how you will update your profile. And for this goes for everybody. We all come into, you're all coming into this major. As we said, a lot of you are career changers. Some might be right out of school from an undergrad. But we all have work experience in our past. What you're going to want to start to do as you move forward in revising and tailoring your LinkedIn profile and your resume going forward is to think about all of your past experience. And you want to think clearly about how, how can I transfer the skills that I have used or developed in my past experience over into the LIS field. For example, which skills are transferable? So what is that information that I'm bringing with me? Because you're going to have to tailor, you start tailoring your resume so that everything on the resume adds value to the type of job that you're going to want to go into. So that everything on your resume, and this goes for your LinkedIn profile as well, is purposeful. It has meaning. Um, it's not that I'm going to keep all my past experience on my resume and keep it written for, I'm just going to use this as an example, say I've worked in insurance. Say I work for GEICO and, and I do insurance. Um, and I've done that for, say, 10 years. And now I'm going to um, high school because I'm looking to make a career change. So when I go to create my resume, I'm not going to keep everything on my resume written for my insurance field for GEICO and talk about specifically the things that I did in that job that relate to the insurance industry. I'm going to look at what did I do in my work in the insurance industry and what skills did I use that I can take with me or bridge over into this LIS field that I want to go into. And now how do I write those statements differently? So I'm going to try to do this off the top of my head. But say part of my job was reaching out to my clients um, to upsell them on insurance coverage, for example. Okay, I'm not going to have that on my resume when I go into the LIS field, right? Because it doesn't relate in any way. But what areas from that statement that I said what skills can you pull out from what I said that would relate, that would bridge over? Just type them in. What are some skills that you can think about? So customer service, tons of that. Um, I'm going to go back to that one, teaching. Customer service, problem solving, yes. Okay, customer service, problem solving, outreach, right? More customer service, multitasking, management skills, explaining details, being a liaison with clients, all right, or working with a variety of patrons, computer skills, uh, <laughs> shelving books. Maybe, maybe I'm doing things digitally. Right? Maybe I have different policies and procedures and books that are online and it's, and it's digitizing. So all of those skills that you all just mentioned, I would use those skills and focus my accomplishment statements for my experience with GEICO on, focus it on, on demonstrating those skills in a generic way so that the reader of my resume can see very clearly 
how my past experience working in insurance relates over into the LIS field. So I'm hoping that that makes sense, but I would talk about generally the skills that I develop as a problem solver. I would talk about that I provide outreach of services available to a variety of patrons. I provide outstanding customer service using strong communication skills over the phone, online, and in person. I am highly skilled at managing a variety of tasks, um, working under tight time constraints um, in, in a busy environment. Um, I use strong communication skills to explain details on how to find information online. Um, so hopefully that's making sense, right? You, I mean, I, I'm doing this in a kind of off, off the top of my head sort of way, but hopefully you're being able to see the connection of what you're going to want to start to do or start thinking about how you would do it with your past experience to the resume, to your profile online. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. So it's good. So you want to start thinking about this because that's the part that I try to get people to connect that in their minds. That's when you're going to have really successful resumes and successful LinkedIn profiles. I'm just going back to chat to see if there were any questions that I missed. Um, let me explore other fields. That's Kim. Yeah, you're right, Ariel. You, leaving teaching, you're right. You don't need to assume you're going to be a school librarian at all. The, the options are wide open for you. And people coming from teaching, you have a variety of skills that you were going to be taking with you, but it doesn't mean that they have to go directly over into the teaching environment either. Okay, let's see, anything else? Okay, uh, let's see, got a 15 more minutes. Let's see what else I've gotten here for people. All right, so that was LinkedIn. Uh, oh, and this leads into resume, which we were kind of just talking about. So when you get to that point of resume writing, we have a lot of good, really good resume writing sections under the Career Development tab. This is probably the most commonly utilized section of the whole Career Development section is resume writing. This is probably the most common area that I get questions from, from all of you. Um, it's, a, it's a big area and we all get worried about it and I know it's hard when you're being a career changer and you're not sure how to go about revising the resume. So check out the resources that are here. Know that I am here to help. You can always email me your questions. Most of my work is um, critiquing resumes from students. I do it via email. So you send me an email, you attach your resume to it. Um, as a, just a regular attachment. If you can remember, save your resume as a Word doc because that way I like to open it up, I like to go into it, and I oftentimes will move things around. Maybe I play with the formatting on your page, I add comments to things, I might change some sentences up. So I kind of really work on that document. So send it to me as a Word doc and I will send it back to you. Please do give me up to seven days to get back to you because um, sometimes I fall behind, sometimes I'm right on it. More often it feels like I'm falling a little bit behind, so, so give me that leeway to get, get back to you. So Rocio says, I found knowing the right people seems to be way more important than resumes, true or false? I'm going to say it's true and it's false and here's what I'm going to say. Um, knowing the right people is 100% true in getting your foot in the door, in getting um, an interview in many cases, and oftentimes in getting the job because employee referrals are super important. However, with that said, you still need to have a rockin' resume in order to hand to that person. So let's just use this as an example. Say, uh, Rocio, you and I are networking connections. I have a job over here and you found out about the job for me, from me and I'm like, yeah, I, w I want you to talk to, you know, um, Sally over in HR. I think you'd be fantastic for this job. 
but send me your resume because I need to get that over to her so she can contact you. So if you end up sending me a crappy looking resume, one, that's going to make me look bad. Secondly, that's not going to make Sally be very impressed with you. So you still need to have a really good resume that you're going to hand to me, that I'm going to hand to Sally. Sally's going to look at it and she's going to go, yeah, I totally want to talk to her. And then she's going to reach out and follow up with you. So that's why my answer was it's true and it's false. So yeah, you want to know the people, but you've also got to have your documents set up, looking professional and being impressive. Another important thing to resumes is there's a whole mental process when you go through the process of writing and again, a rocking resume, like something that is just awesome, right? You have now mentally prepared yourself for your interview because now you understand yourself really well. You've connected the dots on this piece of paper about how your past experience can relate to this new job that you're going into. So then when you get into the interview situation and you're sitting in front of somebody and now they're asking you to verbally tell them how your past experience relates over into this job that I have, you're all ready to go. You've done a lot of that mental work already and you're able to articulate it. But if you haven't done that on paper, you're going to struggle when you get in front of people and have to articulate it. So. Resumes are way more important than you think they are. All right, Maggie says, I've been a stay-at-home parent and have a decade gap. What do I do about that? Obviously, I have skills from that job, but it seems tacky to list them. So, Maggie, I can work with you. Yours is going to be a little different, obviously, than other people's, but we are going to work with what we have, and we're going to work to fill that gap. Um, I would be asking you lots of questions about what type of, type of volunteer work did you do? Have you been involved in the schools? Um, you know, how were you spending your time? Or were you taking other classes? Were you teaching yourself something? Did you do an online class? I mean, I'm going to start digging to see what we can come up with to fill in that gap. Um, we would rely heavily on your courses that you're taking in iSchool right now. We are going to rely heavily on projects that you've worked on because we want to be able to demonstrate your skills and experience in some way. So you are not the only person that has been a stay-at-home mom and come to this program, so I'll work with you. So I would ask that people do as much as they can on their resumes and then send me it, meaning I would prefer not to have kind of your junk which means people didn't put any effort into it or it's the resume you've had from five years ago and then you just send it to me and go, hey, what do I do with this? I want you to try, you know, put some effort into it and then, and then send it over. Okay. So when you get to the point of interviewing, whether it's for a volunteer job, a part-time job, an internship, we have a whole lot of interviewing resources on the site. I'm just pointing them out because I want you to know that they're there. The red interview, or the red interview, the red arrow is pointing to a very underutilized resource, but it's a fabulous resource. It's called Practice with Big Interview. Big Interview is an online mock interviewing tool, and it's there for you to use it. So check it out. You can videotape yourself and, re you know, record what you're saying as you practice answering interview questions and then you can go back and review it and hear how you sound and I know that sounds horribly painful, but it is the best way to practice. So do check that out. Justin says, I've used it. It's really useful and easy to use. Awesome. Or was that Justin or that? Yes, and Ariel. Oh, very good. Thank you for that because I do feel like it is a great resource but highly underused. So um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, what is that? I don't know. Positivity there. And wow, is that it? Oh, oh, there it is. So that's what a big interview looks like. There's a code that you'll put in because it's set up just for SJSU people. The interview roulette. Oh, I'm going to make note of that. Hold on. I'm going to write that down in my notes, interview roulette. So I guess that means you just get, you don't even know what kind of questions you're going to get, right? It's just random. Interview roulette. All right. Excellent. Whew. I think that's it. I think there's some, oh, there we go. Okay, everybody. Uh, we got a few minutes left. Are there any other questions for me at this point? And we're also doing something new. I have, let me see if I can get this. I am going to 
put a link to an evaluation. Uh, I don't want all of that. Okay. There, I got it. So as you start to disappear on me, if you could click on and do this evaluation, we're starting to collect some feedback as well. 